The market has priced in a soft landing for the economy, and a lot of folks here at Davos in the world, in, for the World Economic Forum also looking for a soft landing. Let's talk to Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan. Brian, great to get some time with you, as always. Um, soft landing, what does that mean to you, actually, and do you see it playing out? Well, it's great to be here, and, and you know, what a soft landing is, you don't go negative in GDP growth on a quarterly basis, and so our team, if we were talking last year, and we did talk last year, they basically said we were going to have a recession later in, in 23, early 24, and as the year went on, they pushed that out. And so now their basic view is we dropped from the growth rate in the third quarter for plus down to 1% annualized GDP growth for the first three quarters. That is a soft landing. It didn't go negative, but it, it landed and got near zero. And, and so that, that's, that's the prediction. The team does a great job, and that's where they come out. And that's largely due to the consumer and the consumer strength and the resiliency and the spending and the capitalism and the you know, entrepreneurism and, and innovation in the U.S. That's what's, the U.S. is different. Are rates going to fall as fast as they rose? Our team has four cuts next year and four cuts in 25. And so that gets you down in the three, three and a quarter, three and a percent, three and a half percent uh, range. Um, so that will feel quick, but it's, go, it, it's less the pace, it's where it stops out. And what, I, what would be good for the U.S. is they could actually get to a normal rate curve, which for 15 years we haven't had. Like for a moment we had it in, in 1819, and then they started cutting rates. People forget it in 19, they had to cut rates to push the economy. So we have that eight cuts over two years. Inflation gets down to the target for the Fed at the end of 25, so it takes some time. And people say it's higher, but in the grand scheme of history, that's not higher. It's just higher since you know, the financial crisis. On a global basis, rates fell, and now they're coming back up to be a little more. So there's what the sort of official forecasts from your researchers say, and then there's what people say, right? Yeah. And you talk to an enormous number of people. Yeah. Um, you're talking to a lot of people here in Davos. You talk to a lot of business leaders in the U.S. What's the vibe like, right? You know, maybe there's going to be a soft landing, but how are people feeling? Well, if you think about over the course of last year, you know, this Davos, last Davos, this Davos, every last year was recessions coming, and you know, inflation's high, and the Fed, the Fed and the central banks around the world took off. If you think about all that, that creates a pretty pessimistic air for people yeah. to operate in. So what happened during the course of years? Confidence came down by consumers. They slowed down their spending from a 10% year-over-year -year growth rate to four to five percent, which is more normal. Um, and so that all affects people. Um, mid, small, medium-sized business in the U.S., we have 12 million small business customers, we have tens of thousands of middle market customers. You know, their line usage flattened back out. So pre-pandemic, they'd use 40% of their line of credit availability on a given day. Uh, during the pandemic, it dropped to 30 because things slowed down. Rose back up to 36, then it's been bouncing around 35, 36. It didn't keep going back up to the level it was. That's a conservatism building. And so that's what's kind of going through. That's what you read about. And then inflation attacks uh, the, the people's uh, ability to have, you know, provide for their families and stuff. And so that's a pessimist. The reality, though, is look at what they do. They're still spending at four, four to five percent more in the first part of 24 versus the first part of 23. They are still going out to, uh, the restaurant spending is still very strong. Uh, uh, entertainment spending is still very strong. So if you're really, really, really worried about you know, your day-to-day -day thing, you wouldn't do that. So what's happening is people are getting more conservative. They're making the choices uh, in the median income and, uh, households. They're making choices about what to buy, what not to buy. Uh, but the rate structure slow down, car purchase, house purchases, but fixed rate mortgages give people uh, an anchor against windward. So, but their spending hasn't changed as much as their emotions have. Right. And now you're seeing they're, they're coming a little bit more in line as you see confidence build up a little bit, views of inflation stayed in check. And that, that's kind of interesting right now. Mm. Brian, every time we talk to you uh, in 2023, the consumer always seemed to be surprising to the upside, to yep. your point. Spending more on services, spending more, maybe a little more than some people throw on hard goods. But as we in year, the election in this country, yeah. there's been a real, I think a lot of concern amongst the leaders we've been talking to yeah. about how that election might turn out. Do consumers do consumers finally pull back uh, because they fear an outcome? You know, I, I, don't, I don't think so because the election goes on cons you know, consistently. The, the dialogue's out there that all, that all you and your colleagues put out there. So it's not like, it's, it's not like people didn't know 24 uh, election was coming, and by the way, there was a congressional election in a half year, so there's always something going on, and then at state and local levels. So, you have the real sort of, you have the geopolitical risk out there. You have the, the fact that governments have to slow down their rate of spending growth. Um, they, a lot of fiscal stimulus, they have to bring that back in. The United States has to get its budget more in line. Who, whoever's in office understands that. That's not a mystery. That's why you have the debates in Congress among the whole Congress. How do we 
start to balance the decision. So that, that's got to go. And by the way, that's universal around the world. And so the idea of getting government spending and local governments and state governments, the U.S., same things, getting that. So those are drags and possibilities. But meanwhile, just follow what the consumer does versus what they say, which is the first two weeks in January, they spent four to five, four and a half percent more than they spent last year, two weeks into January. And then, you know, and so they, they're, they're continuing to participate in the economy. Why? Because they're employed. Why? Because wage growth has been strong, um, flattening out, but stronger. And so if you're employed and you have money, you're going to make the choices. And so I think the election will affect that, but they sorted through it, through, you know, a lot of elections in our company's history, our country's history. And a, you know, all the other countries. So I don't worry about the elections doing it. There'll be a lot of talk about the impact, but I think the reality is, you know, the, it's, the, it, the U.S. economy is driven by the private sector and consumers and things that really are affected by elections but not deterred by elections. I, I mean, all of that said, it seems a rather unusual election in some ways, right? You've got one of the candidates who is under indictment on multiple fronts. You've got the other who there's concerns about his age. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. Does it affect business decisions? I mean, on the part of Bank of America, for example. I mean, how do you even begin to, to game some of that out? Well, one of your colleagues asked me, do you have a drawer for candidate X or candidate Y? I said, that'd be a lot of drawers, because think <laughs> about the changes in the UK, prime ministers, the changes in the French prime minister. We, we're affected by that. So, so when you run a company, as my colleagues do at Bank of America, the teammates that run it, and the companies around the world, you have to be ready for any scenario. And so our job is not to predict elections. Our job is to be able to go no matter what the circumstances are in our country's elections, the US elections or not. And I tell people, our our company started in 1784, the oldest part. There's been a lot of elections. There's been a lot of, and so you have to have a, a way to operate the company for profits and purpose. You have to have a way to operate the company for the benefit of our customers, our teammates, and our shareholders, and, and society. I mean, those are principles. And so the elections will come and go. We try to help every administration on both parties with our best thinking and some take it some don't take it some take it a little bit and it, our job as a business community and as Bank of America is to help uh, mm -hmm. uh, governments be successful because if they're successful we're going to be successful. Uh, another big bet you're, you're making is on, on AI. You yeah. seem to be spending a, a large sum of money this year in, in modernizing yeah. the bank. How will AI change banking? Well we have a, this uh, capability called Erica, and so Erica was started about seven years ago, and it, it is effectively AI. It's a natural language processing engine. It, it's very straightforward compared to the, uh, the autonomous language, but it was the same thing. We had to go to somebody and get produce the language. You had to produce an analytical environment around it, use our data, and it has 18 million consumers using 170 million interfaces last quarter, so it's not like, may this happen, it's happening. Each one of those was in a phone call, uh, email, a text, or some, or walk into the branch, and so it saves uh, money. So that's just an example of how we're using it. So we completely believe that this will have a big impact. The, the question is you've got to have your data right, and we have spent billions of dollars to get our data uh, 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 consistency throughout our organization, and we're not perfect. Then you have to have the ability to convert processes to the technique through algorithm models and, and, and uh, language models and learning models. The tr trick in that is we have to have accountability. We have to have, uh, 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 we have to be able to say, if we made a decision to turn down a loan, how to do it, why did we do it, what were the factors, because that's the law. Otherwise, it could be discriminatory. And so in regulated industries, it's going to be a trickier application. Now, to help somebody do the work, with which then they take it and do something, fine. It's much easier. Programming, we're already using in programming. It's saving uh, money. Again, you got to have a psychological change. Your programmers have to learn how to use it and what they're going to do next versus what they did before. Great, great possibilities for us. I still think in the early stages in terms of adoption, our company's a lot of hype about it, a lot of discussion. It's, you know, you, you could go to 14 sessions here at Davos today on AI, I guarantee you, on some topic. Uh, but those of us that actually deploy, we put $3.8 billion of technology out. We have hundreds and hundreds of algorithm models that have been operating our company for years, years and years. And so this is like a, a natural movement along a path and we're already doing it, and we think it has great hope, but you've got to make sure you're moving right with the customer, right with the, uh, the uh, integrity of the operating systems, and right with the regulatory framework. And um, finally, I, I want to ask you about DEI a little bit, because as you know, there's been a backlash yeah. against diversity and inclusion programs. You're the um, council chair for yeah. global D diversity and inclusion at yeah. Bank of America, so obviously you yeah. think it's important. So what do you make of the backlash, and, and how do you do it in the right way? Well, it, these things ebb and flow, and they get talked about in ways that are not really about some of the topics that are involved, and so you get a lot about uh, social policies and stuff like that. Look, 
we listen to our team. We have 200,000 plus teammates. We have 180,000 in affinity groups. We have a strong DNI council that represents the company. We have sub councils underneath it. And so, and they just give us insight as to what they need. And so we are continuously trying to improve our company, provide opportunity that anybody can come to our company, be who they are, and be as successful as they want to be. So last night I was talking to uh, a group of around the military and uh, with honor, and a group that Ride Barcott runs. And so we hired 17,000 veterans over the last few years. Yesterday, our teammate Eric Shimp celebrated his 10th anniversary of the company. Ten years ago, he started with a company out of the military, West Point Military, came back, starts on a fr leaves military on a Friday, starts on a Monday. He's a receptionist for a day. Ten years later, he's running Merrill Lynch. And that's because he had talent, and he did, but he had never worked in the private sector. So whether it's you know, teammates coming to the military, whether it's teammates coming from uh, Title I high schools into our operating platforms, call centers, that's why we started $23 an hour so they can invest in a career. What's the teammates have worked with us for 50, 60 years? We're providing opportunity, and so DNI is core to the, is core to how we do that. So we we will do what we do, and we're mindful of the atmosphere around us a lot. But we do, we are committed to having a place where everybody can be successful, male, female, all different ethnicities, and and then we have to help our teammates through tough times. And that's like with the Hamas attack on Israel, we had a lot of Jewish teammates that we had to go in and support. Um, we had teammates you know, affected by the Ukraine uh, situation. We have teammates affected by all things going on. And so we're, we're against hate speech. We're, we've been supporting uh, the Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism, which has a broader purview now and trying to help. We're trying to educate teammates on how to have the dialogue in the company. But you know, it, it's what our teammates want. It's what's good for the company. It's part of who we are, and we continue to do it. And at the fringes, we'll get advice from a lot of people about what's right and right wrong, but it's, we run the company the way we run the company. Uh, we have to leave it there. Bank of America CEO Brian Monahan, thanks for always giving us time uh, here. A very cold, uh, no jacket again for the second time this year. It's, uh, it's, it's balmy out today. It must be <laughs> yeah, balmy. Yeah, balmy. All right. Brian, so good to see you. We'll talk to, to you see. soon. Thank you.